As Unki Kwakwai and his flymates flew through the cold air of Dunmoreau for another scouting run with his goggles on tight as his flight suit did its best to keep him warm, he could not help but feel dread at what he could see peeking over the horizon and making its way through the searing gorge and towards his home. Namely, campfires. Thousands upon thousands of campfires. He, like other pilots, had been patrolling the edges of Dunmoreau pushing the limits of how far their machines could reach with no other places besides home to refuel for months now on the order of the High Tinkerer. Ever since these otherworldly invaders called the Horde had destroyed Stormwind, both Ironforge and Nomarigan were worried they would turn their attention north to fuel their lust for conquest. For a while the Orcs, those green-skinned creatures that made humans seem small, seemed happy enough ravaging the former lands of Stormwind, but he and others noticed how they kept building and building up their forces. They made countless weapons in their equally countless forges, built hundreds and hundreds of siege weapons, and gathered more and more troops at Blackrock Mountain. All signs pointed towards the Horde preparing for further conflict. Some in Iron Forge even believed that the Horde had allied with their cast-out cousins, the Dark Iron Clan, after hearing about how they had so easily taken territory that belonged to the dark-skinned dwarfs. Judging by the quality of the arms and armor of the Horde that Honky and other pilots could see through their spyglasses, they believed it. Day by day, Honky watched as the war machine pointed toward his home grew more and more terrible, the vastness of it all enough to make him feel hopeless. Then the horrible day came when the army started to move north as everyone had predicted, and all Honky and his flymates could do was report back how much closer the Horde got every day to Dunmoreau. Soon they would be entering the first passes and tunnels into the snowy region, but they would be ready. He hoped. His were not a warlike people, the gnomes never having to face any large-scale conflict in all their history. They invented for betterment, progress, exploration, industry, and fun. Not for war. Onki was feeling glad now that the dwarfs saw fit to create the tools of war that might allow them to survive this coming calamity. He didn't know what he would do if they didn't have guns and bombs to even the scale against such a terrible foe. But not even the dwarfs of Iron Forge, their closest friends, allies, and some even believed cousins, had seen large-scale fighting since the War of Three Hammers over two centuries ago, and that would be more comparable to a small skirmish compared to this. They were not like the humans, who seemed to exist in a near-constant state of war and were out of their element against a seemingly unending hostile force who had already destroyed a whole kingdom that had won its last two wars against terrible threats, but fallen here. Already both rulers had sounded the evacuation of all dwarfs and gnomes in Kars mode into the safety and fortifications of the cities, resulting in a situation where both Ironforge and Nomarigan contained practically every living soul in the entire region. Rushed efforts were being done to upgrade and improve upon both capitals' already extensive defenses while both populations were being put through hurried militia training to fight alongside the proper military of both kingdoms if need be. The idea that things were so grim and the threat so large that everyone had to fight. It made Onki glad there were gnomes and dwarfs far to the north so that should the worst happen. He didn't even want to think about it. Still, the best he could do right now as the Horde drew steadily closer was to keep an eye on their movements and make sure that the Dwarfs knew where to hit them to make them really hurt. After all, it wasn't as if the Horde had anything that could bring down true gnomish craftsmanship. Ironforge was talking about arming things like his baby with guns and bombs so they could do more, but the idea of his machine being used for such violence and not flying and exploration like she was made for made him sick to his stomach. There had been proposals like that before, of course. While his people did not like using their inventions for violence, they were not stupid or blind enough to not notice the possibilities, but there had simply never been any need before now. Still, war required sacrifices and if that was the worst thing that he would have to compromise on, then it would be a blessing. A quick look at his fuel gauge showed he was nearing the halfway point, so he signaled his flymates and they turned around to head home for maintenance and refueling both for their machines and themselves. The next flight would take over the scouting and patrolling while they reported on what they found and got their rest. Unfortunately, one thing was undoubtedly certain. The Horde had come to Kars Moden. Just a little more. Bran Bronzebeard, youngest of the brothers Bronzebeard, said quietly as he looked through his spyglass at the approaching Greenskin army that was making their way through the single pass they hadn't yet collapsed. Once word had come through of the Horde's advance into Dunmoreau proper he and his fellow mountaineers, 
along with the demolition teams, got to work right quick to make certain the horde only had one way to go. They knew they couldn't stop the tide of greenskins, but they could slow them down and make sure they went where they wanted. With that in mind, they left this large pass suspiciously open. Oh, Bran was sure the Horde's leadership had noticed, but the bastards couldn't do anything about it unless they wanted to spend weeks digging through the collapsed passes and tunnels or brave a trek through the high mountains. So they sent their army through. And surprisingly nothing happened, so they just kept going. The ambush they were likely expecting did not come and they began to lower their guard. Bran didn't believe in fighting fair against already unfair odds, which was why he and his fellows set up a trap for the Greenskins, one which relied on his knowledge of the mountains. There was no other dwarf in all of Kars Moden that knew these mountains' geography as well as he. And none knew their geology as well either. Bran watched the Greenskins patiently as they slowly marched themselves to their deaths. Now. He signaled to the various demo teams throughout the area, firing a flare into the sky for everyone in the area to see. That got the Horde to stop short and get on guard, likely thinking it was the beginning of some kind of magical attack. Oh no, Bran had far worse in store for the monsters. He had a lot of friends from Stormwind to avenge after all. All around the Horde's advancing force, muted booms could be heard coming from every direction, causing many orcs to look around them in confusion trying to find the source of the noise. But then a new sound began booming throughout the pass. One that rumbled like thunder and came with all the force of a tsunami on land. Bran picked this spot specifically to force the Horde through since its mountain peaks were full of snow. Snow which was easily dislodged by a few well-placed explosives. Rushing toward the horde like an unrelenting wave, snow and stone tumbled down from the surrounding mountains, funneled specifically to crash down on the approaching army. They recognized the danger right away and many attempted to flee, but none could outrun the avalanche that Bran had meticulously planned. Bran and his forces watched from the safety of their carefully selected spots as the front part of the horde's army simply vanished in mere moments as the green skins were buried in snow until the pass was no longer a pass. By the time it was over, there was nothing left but a large hill of debris that would take the Horde no small amount of time and resources to even attempt to get past. Still, even Bran was shocked as he witnessed a few of the creatures dig themselves out of their tomb. Not many, and clearly very injured, but the fact that anything at all survived that avalanche was nothing short of amazing. And terrifying. Just how tough are these damn things? Bran couldn't help but growl as he saw what few survivors of the trap pulled themselves out of the snow. Even worse, this wasn't even the whole army, merely the frontmost part of it, and Bran was sure it was the expendable part since the Horde had been no doubt expecting an ambush. Now that they had shown them what they were capable of, Bran was certain that the Horde would be more careful going through Dunmoreau. Of course, that wasn't all of his tricks, and the more successful they were at slowing the Horde down the more time his eldest brother and king had time to prepare his people and the gnomes. If the Horde wanted to make their way through Dunmoreau to attack his home, then he would make them pay in blood for every step they took. After all, Bran thought as he picked up his rifle and looked down its scope, aiming directly at the healthiest looking orc that had survived the trap and even now was looking for its weapon, no one knows these mountains better than me. Thus was the first official shot of the invasion of Kars Moden made that day, followed by many others as the dwarves of Ironforge drew first blood. For Kars Moden. Muradin Bronzebeard, middle child of the brothers Bronzebeard and Hythane of Ironforge, let out a furious war cry as he split an orc in twain with his rune axe in one hand while crushing the head of another with his hammer. He didn't allow himself to slow down for a single moment, with each strike of his weapons outright killing or at least mortally wounding every orc that attempted to get close to him. An orc raider, riding upon its giant wolf mount, attempted to ram him only for him to toss his hammer into the rider, knocking the orc off clean into the air and collapsing its chest. Muradin swiftly followed up ramming his axe into the wolf's skull, killing it instantly. With a raised hand his hammer flew back to him, returning to his grip easily and its head stained with blood and pieces of bone. That wasn't the end of it though as the creature that shouldn't even be able to breathe picked itself up, coughing blood all the while, and ran at him with his axe raised high. Muradin admired the determination if nothing else, even if he wished it wasn't pointed at his people. He blocked the orc strike with his hammer and counterstuck with his own axe, bisecting the orc from his waist to his shoulder. Try getting up from that. Muradin growled as the two halves of the orc fell down dead. 
Several more orcs charged at him, in hopes of avenging their fallen comrade, but their efforts were useless. Not only was Muradin a highly accomplished warrior, but every single piece of gear that he was wearing was heavily enchanted and masterfully crafted. That meant that Muradin slaughtered the orcs easily as soon as they drew close enough to meet his axe. All around him the sounds of battle could be heard as he and his warriors did combat with a party of orc scouts. Doughty warriors fought and killed creatures nearly three times their size, all with skill and bravery while armed and armored with the best Iron Forge had to offer. Muradin had been leading parties such as this for weeks now, for while they could not beat the horde in numbers face to face they could ride out on their rams and slaughter their scouting parties and the smaller warbands that the horde sent ahead to secure ground. At first, it was easy. Using their mounts and their home environment to their advantage, they usually managed to get the drop on the creature, take them out quickly, and then head off before any reinforcements could come. The goal was to blind the horde as much as possible, while their own eyes in the sky kept constant watch on them. This made it easier to lead them into traps, dead ends, and slow them down more and more, delivering a thousand cuts to a colossal beast until it bled out. Sadly, as the weeks dragged on and the horde's main body kept on marching into Dunmoreau their numbers and forces grew. And so did the challenge to fight them back. First, it was the ogres, lumbering brutes that were twice the size of the orcs themselves. Stupid as stones but just as strong and tough to kill as they looked. Muradin had seen many brave dwarf warriors be crushed under their bulk or tossed aside with ease, their bodies collapsing under the immense strength of the stupid creatures. They were dumb muscle, yes, but muscle all the same. Of course, they were nothing compared to the two-headed variants who could actually think. They had all the strength and toughness of their less intelligent cousins, but also the ability to use arcane magic, not unlike the mages up north. Although unlike them they used their magic brutally and savagely but no less effectively against his warriors. Thankfully they were rarer to see on the battlefield than the single-headed and non-magical kind. But the worst were not the ogres, oh no. There was something far worse among the horde that showed their wicked nature more than anything else Muradin had ever seen. Death Knight. One of his warriors cried out in warning, and Muradin was quick to turn his head and see the approaching enemy reinforcements, more orc raiders being led by the being in question. An abomination of life and death riding upon an equally undead steed, the former knights of Stormwind rode again as monsters in service of the Horde. He knew not what foul magics animated them, only that they took delight in slaughter and that they thrived in death. Muradin recalled seeing the little life of dwarf warriors being sucked out of them before such creatures, seemingly refusing to fall no matter how much damage they suffered. And worst of all, the monsters raised the dead as mindless servants, both enemies and allies, to sick upon the living. Such creatures took far too many lives to take down, especially when every living dwarf was needed in this war, so there was only one thing to do at this time. Fall back. Fall back. He bellowed his order for all to hear disengage and fall back. It was sadly an order that he had to give more and more as the fighting kept on. He and his warriors killed and killed, but it didn't feel as if they were even making a dent in the horde's numbers. It seemed no matter how many bands he personally saw defeated, the horde's movement continued undaunted. So it was with an increasingly heavy heart as he helped cover his warriors' retreat before mounting his ram and beating feet to safety as fast they could. Thankfully, despite the speed and endurance of the Death Knight's undead steeds, they were still limited in how they could move like the live horses they once were, while Iron Forge's rams were made to move within their mountainous home. They quickly escaped their enemies and made for safety to regroup, married and counting his party to see how many they had lost. Less than he feared, more than he hoped. His was not the only warrior band striking at the horde where they could, but their casualties were building quickly and soon it would not be safe for even probing attacks. They might be slowing down the horde, but he wondered at times if they were only delaying the inevitable. No, he shook his head. I can't think like that. Let's get home, lads. We'll get them back next time. He encouraged his men. Though I wished I believed it more myself. Deep in the military ward of Iron Forge, dwarfs and gnomes of all kinds were rushing around delivering reports, transporting messages, giving status updates, and everything else needed to help run an army as smoothly as possible. This was the first major conflict for the people of Iron Forge in centuries, but they had been training and preparing since that time, even if the enemy they were facing was far from the one they were expecting. Within said ward the King of Iron Forge himself, 
Magni Bronzebeard, stood next to his fellow ruler and close friend, Jelbin Megatork, high tinkerer of Nomaregan. Both were listening to Angus Stonehammer, captain of the Ironforge Guard, give them a personal update about the conflict with the Horde. It was not good news. They simply number too many, he repeated the fact that all knew but dreaded to hear. Our efforts have slowed them down considerably, but the Horde soldiers are tough and determined. They will reach our gates soon, my lords, and we have no hope of matching them in open combat. All other major settlements and holdouts have fallen, their populations here, fled or worse. Then we make our stand, King Magni said grimly. We've done all that we can and now we must trust that our defenses will see us through this dark night. We've made all the preparations we could in such a short time, Jelbin finally spoke up. But no Morrigan is not Iron Forge. I fear we will prove to be a weak link to you, dear friend. Nonsense. No Morrigan's gates are as tough as ours and your inventions will scare off the Horde, this I'm sure. Magni was quick to counter his friend's dire words. Still. Should the worst happen. Jelbin started hesitantly, before his expression turned to one of firm resolve. I'll evacuate as many of my people as I can through the tunnels connecting us together. Then you'll close the gates behind them and collapse them. Only if you promise to offer my people the same, Magni said grimly. Knowing the horde they will come at us first, thinking we are the toughest nut to crack, and breach our walls first. Only because your people have shown you are the better warriors, while all we've done, Jelbin started, only to be interrupted by Magni. Is provide invaluable aerial reconnaissance, nearly all your city's engineers to help strengthen our defenses and build our weapons, lend me your clerks and workers to help run the logistics for my warriors, and a million other things, said Magni, listing out the gnome's many contributions. Your people are not weak Jelbin, your strengths are many and have been proven time and again. Ironforge is blessed to have an ally like No Morrigan in these dark times. Jelbin could only smile at the kind words, even if the smile did not reach his eyes and he did not totally believe them. His thoughts turned to the steam armor that he had begun constructing as soon as he learned of the Horde, but he knew that it would not be ready nearly in time. His people had not been ready for war. Still, we still have time to do what work we can and make sure we are ready, Jelbin finally decided to say after a moment of silence. We'll double-check the stockpiles, but according to my calculations, we should have enough supplies to last us years if we manage it right. We can still mine, get water, and build things even during a prolonged siege, and we have the experimental mushroom farms working overtime to produce all the food we might need. So the only way we are losing this fight is if the horde breaks in our front door, which we won't allow, Magni said with a cruel smirk. They'll drown in their own blood before they even make a dent, you'll see. While I am not one for such graphic descriptions, I hope so my friend, Jelbin nodded solemnly, hating the loss of life but also knowing it was the only way for them to survive. I must return to Nomaregan soon to go over any final checks before the Horde reaches us. That and I'm sure Sicko is getting tired of being in charge while I'm over here, he finished with a laugh. To victory then, my friend, Magni said as he grabbed nearby Mug of Ale. To peace, Jelbin said as he grabbed his own mug. Hopefully, they could share another drink when this was all over and they were still alive. Hopefully. What an utter waste of time, Orgrim Doomhammer, war chief of the Horde, could not help but growl. While the invasion of Karsmodin was necessary for the Horde to get access to the resources it needed to invade the northern human kingdoms it didn't mean that the whole experience wasn't a bloody slog the entire way. The dwarfs, and surprisingly even the gnomes, had resisted their advance with a determination that was very orc-like, worthy of respect for their courage and fortitude. They made the Horde fight for every inch they gained and were still making the it as all attempts at breaching Iron Forge and Nomaregan produced only failure and piles of orc corpses. It got so bad that Doomhammer had no choice but to put a stop to the assaults and simply instruct Kilrog to die and his bleeding hollow clan to keep up the siege and keep them contained. They had what they needed anyhow, full control of Kars Modan's natural resources and access to the dwarven forges that they had conquered during the course of their invasion. The Bleeding Hollow would keep the short folk contained while the Blackrock would create more armaments and siege weapons for the Horde to better prepare them for their northern invasion. It was absolutely essential that they destroyed the humans as quickly as possible so that his people could have a new home away from their dying homeland. They had to strike before they could be destroyed. For that cause, there was nothing that he would not do and no line that he would not cross. 
He would even suffer Gul'dan's continued survival and that of his pet ogre so long as the traitorous warlock kept providing death knights. The abominations had proven their worth several times over during the course of the invasion and had done much to smash apart organized resistance to their advance. That would change once the war was over and the warlock's assistance was no longer so valuable, of course. Still, they had much to prepare for still, beyond arming his warriors and recovering the losses taken coming this far. It would be the height of foolishness to attempt to invade the north by land since the only means to do so was across a single bridge no doubt the humans would well fortify. So the only other choice they had to transport his warriors to their enemies would be to cross the sea, something orcs did not particularly have much experience with. Creating a fleet large enough to transport most of the horde that far would take time, time he would need to convince his warriors of this plan and ideally find more allies. Fortunately, he had options on that front such as the creatures called goblins who had been reading out to the horde recently to do business with them, along with envoys from those in the north that had no love of humans, trolls of a different clan from the ones encountered during the war with Stormwind. Time was also his enemy for he knew the northern kingdoms at this time must have been preparing for their arrival, but there was no helping it. For now, they were victorious and that was worth celebrating. They would rest and prepare and then the Horde would conquer the North and destroy anything that could be a threat to their future. It is the only way, he thought as he gripped his family's weapon tightly. Crossus, also known as Coriastras, felt a slight unease as he listened to the Council of Six discuss the most recent news about how things were developing down south. According to all reports, the situation was dire, and Crossus could see the Council members increasing their assessment of the Horde's threat. Have we truly not had any success in our attempts to contact High and Forge or No Morrigan? Asked Dan Siren, his voice filled with surprise. All of our attempts have been complete failures, Kelf Ozad said bluntly. While the Horde's magic is not particularly sophisticated, it has a certain strength to it. Perhaps if I knew more about the magic that they use, then I would have a better idea of how to overcome them. Kelf Ozad spoke the last part while staring pointedly at Antonidas who simply ignored him completely. Crossus knew that Kelth Ozad held the Grand Magus responsible for not allowing him to study more dangerous magic firsthand. Privately, he was grateful that the mortals were smart enough to severely limit the study of such vile magic, he knew far more than they did how dangerous such studies could be, especially in regard to the corruptive powers of Fel and Void. Even the Nerebians don't seem to use Void magic anymore, and they are literally descended from creatures formed from the old god Zeka he thought in the privacy of his own mind. There had once been a time shortly after the Nerebians' disastrous defeat in their war against the Vrukul that some among his people had proposed attacking the creatures while they were at their weakest. After all, their race had been servants of the old gods at the time and was thus considered to be a threat to Azeroth. Ultimately, it was his beloved queen, Alexstrasza, who had opposed the destruction of an entire race of sapient beings, regardless of how dangerous they might be. Crossus had not agreed with his beloved's decision at the time, even if he had kept his thoughts to himself, but he now saw that his queen was far wiser than he. He was still surprised at how much the creatures had changed after not seeing them for a few millennia, and no matter how closely he studied them, he could find no trace of the old god's influence. It seemingly showed that even the old god's forces could grow common sense and abandon the malicious entities. Crossus couldn't help but chuckle to himself at the thought. Has there been any news from Capital City on any progress made by the Council of Seven Nations? Asked Antonidas, continuing to ignore Kelth Ozad as the Archmage glared in his direction. The Grand Magus had a bad habit of bluntly changing subjects that he didn't want to discuss, or that he knew would go nowhere. My contacts in Capital City tell me that there are signs that Gilnius and Ultrak are loosening their opposition, said Crossus, choosing to speak up since he was the one who knew the most about what was happening in Lordaeron's capital. I've heard rumors that King Perinalda was scared stiff over how quickly the Horde managed to conquer Kars Modin, and even King Greymane seems to be disturbed. Living as long as he did made it convenient to form relationships with all sorts of people who knew valuable information. Especially when he could share information with his fellow members of the Red Dragonflight or their Dragon Sworn. After all, he wasn't the only dragon secretly living in mortal society. He himself had a dragon sworn, a half-elf named Garrick Autumnband, who lived in Capital City and served him faithfully. Good, Antonidas said with satisfaction. Perhaps the two of them will end their useless bickering and we can finally take the fight to the Horde. 
Have you had any luck in convincing your father, Prince Galthas? asked Crossus. Given that his mortal form was an elf, it was most appropriate that he be the one to ask such a question. I have not, said Kael'thas, his expression growing frustrated, as it often did when discussing his father. Neither my father nor the Grand Magister are interested in joining this conflict, and do not view the Horde as a significant threat to Quel'Thalas. It was well known that Prince Kael'thas had many disagreements with his father and Silvermoon's magisters about how unwilling his people were to cooperate with outsiders. The prince was much more interested in learning from and collaborating with foreign people to the point that he actually spent more time in Dalaran than Silvermoon. Crossus had known the prince for many centuries, and it made him feel optimistic that Quel'Thalas would have such an open-minded king in the future. Have they been made aware of Anderwyn Lothar's status as a direct descendant of the Arothi bloodline? asked Crossus, referring to the agreement made by Quel'Thalas to repay the debt they owed for the Arothi Empire's assistance during the Troll Wars. He has, which is the only reason that my father is even considering sending aid, said Kael Thars. Although I doubt whatever force they send will be as substantial as it should be. I've been disappointed by my father and the convocation enough times to know better than to expect Quel'Thalas to mobilize its entire military for a threat they consider beneath them. Crossus didn't doubt that the prince's assumption was accurate, there was little chance that Quel'Thalas would be providing large amounts of military aid against the Horde unless they were personally threatened. A part of him wanted to look down on them for that kind of mentality, but he wasn't blind to the fact that many among the Dragonflights felt similarly. Perhaps there might be wisdom in his people remaining generally uninvolved in the affairs of mortals, but the longer he lived among them, the more difficult it became to find such wisdom. His own Dragonflight was by far the most empathetic towards mortals, but even their good intentions had a tendency to be distinctly patronizing. The rest of the meeting was dull yet necessary as they discussed logistics and went over ideas of how Dalaran could best contribute to the defeat of the Horde. It wasn't until near the end of their scheduled meeting time that someone brought up mention of the people that had been on Crossus's mind since their arrival to the Eastern Kingdoms. And what of the Narabians? Kelth Ozad said as the conversation began to lull. Is there anything we can offer to convince them to aid us against the Horde? The Chamber of Air was silent for a moment as the gathered archmages considered the question before Prince Kael'thas let out a derisive chuckle. I sincerely doubt it, said Kael'thas. The majority of their viziers remind me far too much of several magisters that I've spoken to over the years. It doesn't help that they are even more unlikely to view the Horde as a threat given their kingdom's geographical isolation. It was certainly a fair point to make, although not one that filled Crossus with much optimism. There was little chance that Azjol Nerub would consider the Horde to be a significant threat to their kingdom, and they would probably even be right not to. The idea that the Horde could transport a significant force to Northrend, march who knows how far through endless snow, and successfully assault a powerful underground kingdom likely filled with all manner of horrifying creatures was laughable. However, just because the Horde was not likely to be a threat to their safety, did not necessarily mean they were not a threat to the Nerubians' interests. The only problem was that Crossus didn't understand them enough to give an accurate guess as to what they actually wanted from the Eastern Kingdoms. Without that kind of information, it would be hard to convince the Nerubians to enter a war that largely did not affect them. After taking a look around, Crossus could tell from his colleagues' frustrated expressions that they had likely reached the same conclusion. The Council discussed a variety of methods they could use to persuade the Nerubians, but none of them seemed particularly viable. The most feasible proposition was to leverage the relationship the Church of the Holy Light had with the Nerubian spider lord named Anubakan, but it was doubtful that would be enough to change the policy of an entire kingdom. If we are unable to convince Azjol Nerub to fight the Horde, then we must turn our focus to the resources that we can gain from them, said Antonidas, causing the room to grow quiet as they considered what the Nerubians could offer short of sending their warriors. Perhaps they might provide material goods? They certainly seem to have more than enough ore, offered Kelth Ozad, stroking his beard with a thoughtful expression. Lord Aron's diplomats have already begun negotiations with the Nerubian delegation for the exchange of valuable goods, said Crossus, remembering what his contacts told him about the ongoing situation in Capital City. The negotiations are progressing slowly given how Azjol Nerub seems to be nearly as averse to trading and interacting with outsiders as Quel'Thalas. But they thankfully are progressing. If Lordron is already in negotiations with them, then the matter should be left to them, said Modera.
Their silk could be useful for creating the appropriate armor for our mages and soldiers. The few samples of Nerebian silk that, more so than even the rare Kuldor eye silk, they had managed to acquire proved to be highly durable, fairly resistant to bladed weapons, and possessed certain qualities that made it extremely well suited to enchanting and channeling our cane magic. It was similar to chainmail, in a way, but in cloth form. Because most metal armors were not conducive to effective spell casting, which was why the majority of mages were limited to robes and magical means for their defense. If they could equip their military with armor that used such material, then it would be a substantial boost to their combat effectiveness. I will raise the matter with their delegation when I see them in capital city, declared Antonidas. Is there anything else relevant to the war that we could gain from them? Afterward about the Horde's successful conquest of Karsmod and reached the Nerebians, they declared their intention to return to capital city as soon they finished situating their enclave. It made sense that they would want to be at the place where the most important political decisions were taking place during such a tumultuous period in history. The gathered Dutch midges shared thoughtful expressions for several moments, but nobody voiced any further proposals. I have an idea. Although I admit it is quite unorthodox, said Anne Siren, speaking hesitantly after seeing that everyone else kept their silence. Please, friend, in times like these you should not be afraid of voicing your thoughts, said Kael Thars. We need all the ideas we can get. Perhaps I should give some context before I share my proposal, said Anne Siren, pausing for several moments to gather his thoughts before continuing. Several days ago, I went to the Nerebian enclave to ask Vizier Krivax a few questions about his people that I was curious about. Humph. That's the friendly one, correct? asked Modera. Vizier Krivax had very quickly been singled out as one of the easiest members of the Nerebian delegation to actually speak with. This meant many interested parties considered him to be the optimal person to approach if they had a proposal to make to the Nerebians, despite his obvious lack of authority when compared to his peers. Ironically, this meant that one of the most important members of the Nerebian delegation from the perspective of the Eastern Kingdom's diplomats was seemingly one of the least important from the perspective of Azjol Nereb. It was certainly a rather strange situation that the young Nerebian had found himself in. It was like watching a whelp that had somehow managed to place itself in a situation where it spoke for an entire dragon flight. Correct, Vizier Krivax is the friendly one, continued Ansirum. I mainly approached him because of a comment he made during the duel between Arcanist Flame Trail and Vizier Hadix that made me curious. He told me that some spider lords carry around swarms of man-eating insects on their person. While that does admittedly sound quite fascinating, I'm not sure what it has to do with the subject at hand, said Kelth Ozad. When I asked him if he could tell me more about the relationship that the Nerebians have with non-sapient insects and arachnids, we had a long discussion during which he showed me a particular artifact said Anne Siren, continuing on as if Kelth Ozad had not spoken. It was some kind of magical tool that allowed him to telepathically direct the non-sapient members of his species and lesser invertebrates. At the Archmage's words, the members of the council all suddenly seemed to be much more interested. Like the Nerobians' geomancy, that was a form of magic dissimilar to anything that they had in Dalaran and was thus inherently interesting to any mage with even a hint of curiosity. While that does admittedly sound even more fascinating, I'm still not sure what it has to do with the subject at hand, Kelth Ozad drawled. According to Vizier Krivax, while such artifacts are usually only found among the high castes of their society, they are not considered to be any great secret, nor are they very difficult to create, said Anne Siren, throwing an annoyed glance in Kelth Ozad's direction. My proposal is this. We offer to purchase these artifacts at a significant price, alongside the non-sapient creatures that they control to aid in our war effort. Crossus couldn't help but feel a bit dumbfounded at the Ansirum's proposal, and after taking a quick glance around the room he could tell his colleagues were similarly speechless. The idea of simply purchasing living beings from the Nerebians as they would purchase weapons was not something that had occurred to him. Would Azjol Nereb really be willing to make such a deal? Cross's mind raced as he took a moment to consider the matter, and found himself surprised when he couldn't find an immediate reason why they wouldn't. From what he had seen of the Nerebians, there was no indication that they considered the Jormunger or the non-sapient members of their race as any more than tools or beasts of burden, not unlike how the other mortal races treated their own creatures. Not only that, but they were tools that were not particularly difficult to replace from their perspective. 
It wasn't actually that much different from purchasing a golem from Quelthalas, or horses from Stromgard. There was a possibility that the Nerobians might be unwilling to sell the controlling artifacts for fear of them being replicated, but the artifacts weren't particularly valuable without the creatures they were meant to control, which as Jal Nerob would maintain a monopoly over. From their perspective, there really was not much risk at all, which made it much more likely that they would be willing to consider such an arrangement. Even a single Jormunga would have the potential to be a valuable military asset, said Prince Kaelthas, his expression thoughtful as he seriously considered the unexpected proposal. Aside from what damage it could do on its own, it would allow our soldiers to more easily assault entrenched enemy positions. Crossus had a brief mental image of one of the colossal worms burrowing a path into a horde stronghold from below. Their flyers would also be useful for scouting during circumstances where scrying is not possible, said Modera, eyes alight with enthusiasm for the idea. It would be difficult to evaluate what kind of value their skitterers would provide without knowing how many they would be willing to sell, said Crossus consideringly. Against the horde's large numbers, they would definitely need to be deployed en masse to have a sizable military impact. But the question is, what would we give them in exchange? From what I've seen of them so far, the Nerobians seem extremely self-sufficient. Dalaran does not lack for resources, Antonid has said confidently. I'm sure we will be able to reach an arrangement when I speak with them. Well done Archmage Rune Weaver, your proposal is intriguing. The discussion revolved around that topic for several minutes before their scheduled meeting time came to an end. Until they actually spoke with the Nerobian delegation and evaluated their reception to selling non-sapient creatures to be used in the war, there wasn't much more for them to talk about. Crossus left the meeting feeling a bit more optimistic than when it started and spent the entire walk to his home considering the risks and benefits. He wouldn't be surprised if the Nerobians had more hidden away in their underground kingdom than what they had already seen and heard from them so far. Maybe I can convince them later to allow a delegation from Dalaran to visit as Jean Nerob proper in the future once the war is over. He mused. It would be wise to evaluate how their society had developed after freeing itself from the old god's influence. It was so rare to experience new and novel things at his age, so it might even be a pleasant experience. It's a shame we don't have anyone in our dragonflight living in Azjol Nerub. I'll have to raise the matter with my beloved the next time I see her. It was these thoughts that distracted him enough that he almost didn't notice the presence waiting just outside the boundary of the wards surrounding his home. Crossus waved his hand and cast a quick scrying spell, and was surprised when it revealed the presence to be a young female goblin, looking around impatiently while standing outside of his home, obviously waiting for somebody to arrive. That's strange. The goblins don't usually leave the underbelly, and my address shouldn't be known outside of a few people. Crossus couldn't sense anyone else waiting around his home, and a single goblin was obviously not much of a threat, so he didn't hesitate to approach her. It was thanks to his heightened hearing that he could hear the goblin muttering to herself as he drew closer. How long's it gonna take for this mage to show up? I ain't getting paid enough to wait out in the cold. Ah, so she is waiting for me after all. Can I help you? asked Crossus as soon he was close enough for the goblin to hear him, causing her to let out a startled yelp. Jeez. Why is it you elves like sneaking up on people? Should wear a bell or something? said the goblin, glaring at him mulishly. Oh, you have my apologies, Crossus drawled, raising a single eyebrow. How incredibly rude of me to sneak up on the suspicious individual waiting outside of my home, Ems. The name's Melfickle Pinch and there ain't nothing suspicious about it. I'm here on legit business. Got paid to deliver a missive and everything," said the goblin indignantly, pulling out a sealed letter from a pouch secured around her waist and holding it out for him. Crossus looked down on the goblin with a dubious expression and directed his magical senses to the letter, completely unsurprised to discover that it was covered in magic. He looked again at the goblin but couldn't find anything in her expression that would imply that the spells were dangerous, so he took a closer look. It was only after he found that he was unable to recognize a few of the spells that he began to take the matter more seriously. Where did you get this letter? asked Crossus, staring at the goblin for any signs of falsehood. Who is paying you for this delivery? How should I know? The thing showed up in my room in the underbelly with a pile of gold and instructions on it with an address. I'm not one to turn down gold you see, and it seemed like a simple enough job, 
till you started asking questions of course, she grumbled the last part. Plus, I ain't the kind of gal that's dumb enough to cheat somebody who can just show up in my room without me noticing, you hear? Crossus didn't hesitate to immediately look into the goblin's mind. Unfortunately, the goblin seemed to be telling the truth, at least as far as she knew. She wasn't even perturbed by the series of events, having apparently experienced similar things before in her dealings with the Steam Weedle cartel. According to her surface thoughts, she seemed to believe that he was some kind of blood thistle dealer getting in contact with a client. Crossus took a quick second look at the spells attached to the letter and decided that they probably weren't dangerous. The portions that he didn't recognize seemed to be some kind of anti-divination magic to hide the sender's identity and not any kind of curse meant to cause him harm. Thank you, said Crossus as he took the letter from the goblin. Your delivery is complete. You may leave. About time. My arm was starting to get stiff, grumbled the goblin. You ever need something delivered, just ask for Mel Ficklewink. You don't got to worry about me asking any questions or talking to any guards. After giving her pitch, the goblin quickly scampered off, likely not wanting to push her luck with the mage who she believed to be some kind of drug dealer. Crossus watched her for a moment before quickly making his way into his home, shutting the door behind him. As soon as he was alone, Crossus immediately cast a diagnostic spell on the letter, causing a three-dimensional arcane glyph representing the spells to form in the air in front of him. Hmm. How clever. Aside from the anti-divination magic, the other two spells cast on the letter were recognizable to him. One was a spell that would recognize when the letter's intended recipient made physical contact, setting off a timer that would activate a secondary spell after 15 minutes. The second spell would create a small burst of fire that would immediately destroy the letter as soon as it activated. Under normal circumstances, a major skilled as Crossus would easily be able to cast a counter spell to remove both pieces of magic, but there was one problem. Both of the spells were connected to the anti-divination magic, which would need to be removed first if he wanted to cast the counter spell. Given that he had never seen such magic in his very long life, there was little chance he would be able to remove it in a mere 15 minutes. Realizing that he was on a time limit, Crossus decided to test the magic and quickly cast a divination spell that should tell him every person who had touched the letter within the last few months. He watched in fascination as his spell seemed to be immediately caught by the anti-divination ward before being absorbed and somehow used to actually strengthen the ward. How fascinating. I've never seen anything like it. It had been a very long time since Crossus had seen magic that he did not recognize at all, and it immediately made him suspect that the letter had been written by a Nerebian. After all, they were currently the greatest source of new and unknown magic around and were also the people whose motivations he understood the least, so it would make the most sense if it came from them. That, along with the fact that he had sensed someone watching him near his home shortly after his conversation with Vizier Krivax. It was unfortunate that he didn't have time to examine the magic in detail, but given how much effort went into sending him the letter anonymously, its contents were likely important enough that he shouldn't waste any more time. Crossus broke the letter's seal, unfolded the parchment, and immediately stiffened in shock as he realized that the letter was addressed to Coriastras. There aren't many people who should know my true name. Was this letter sent by another dragon? A dragon sworn agent? But then why the subterfuge? As Crossus began reading through the contents of the letter, shock turned to confusion, and then to disbelief at the letter's outrageous claims. After the letter mentioned the dragon soul, a dark artifact the dragonflights had taken great lengths to keep hidden from the world, Crossus began taking the claims a little more seriously. Few should know that it even existed, and nobody besides the highest members of his flight should know that it had recently gone missing. It was only when he reached halfway through the letter that his disbelief vanished and turned into utter, all-consuming rage. As he read about what the orcs intended to do to his beloved, his face contorted into an expression of pure anger and a low growl started to form in his throat. Flickers of flame danced along his skin even as the room around him began to shake. Books flew off of shelves and crashed to the ground, vials of potions shattered into pieces, and the ground beneath his feet began to crumble and crack. His rage was so all-consuming that he actually struggled to retain his mortal disguise. In a fit of unbridled anger, Crossus let out a mighty roar and a wave of magic exploded outward from him, tearing apart the room and only ending when it reached the wards, preventing his outburst from alerting all of Dalaran. 
As the dust settled and the archmage stood panting, surrounded by the wreckage of what had once been a peaceful and beautiful living room, he used every drop of willpower to push down his immense anger. The very idea of the Horde using the dragon soul to do something so evil to the person he loved most in the world made him want to immediately shed his mortal guise and fly south so he could personally burn them all alive. The only thing stopping him from doing just that were the other claims being made in the letter. If Deathwing is truly alive and he's teaching the Horde how to use the Dragon Soul, then stopping him won't be a simple matter. If he was still alive, then Deathwing would be the only aspect still in possession of all the powers bestowed upon him by the Titans. As powerful as Crossus was, his strength would be utterly insignificant when compared to the fallen aspect of the Black Dragon flight. After calming down, Crossus quickly read through the rest of the letter, filing the information as things to be dealt with later. Right now, the only thing he cared about was protecting his beloved. However, the rest of the letter mostly detailed the relationship between the Horde and the Burning Legion, something that he already suspected, and about a specific orc by the name of Guldon. It was all immensely important, but not immediately time-sensitive from what he could tell, unlike the danger threatening his queen. He could worry about the consequences and implications of that information later. The moment that he finished reading, Crossus scanned the letter a second time so he could memorize its contents and immediately began making his way to the scrying mirror contained in his study. Once at his mirror Crossus frantically cast a scrying spell that would hopefully show him Alexstrasza, and almost collapsed in relief when the spell succeeded, causing the mirror to show an image of her flying through the air accompanied by her other consorts. Unfortunately, without them having a scrying tool on their end, there was no way for him to open up a channel of communication, though they were likely aware they were being watched. After this is over, I'm going to invent a portable scrying tool that can be used while flying. I don't care how long it takes. After verifying that his beloved was currently safe, Cross ascended the scrying spell and moved to write a letter of his own that would be magically sent to the Grand Magus if he didn't return to Dalaran within a few days. If the Horde was in possession of the Dragon Soul, then the trip he was about to make would not be a safe one, and the Council would need to be made aware of the truth. Crossus still did not completely believe the contents of the letter that had been sent to him, but if there was even a small chance of it being accurate, then he needed to take action immediately. If it was all a lie, then whoever sent it was going to be deeply regretful for their actions when he found them. Regardless of whether the contents were true or false, whoever wrote the letter knew more than they should. Crossus would without a doubt do everything in his power to find them after the more important matters were dealt with, but what happens if he succeeds would depend on the veracity of their claims. He already has suspicions about who could have sent it, but either way, he would know soon enough whether the contents were true or false. Thankfully as a member of the Council of Six he had the right to cast unscheduled teleports in and out of the city whenever he wanted, something he was happy to abuse now. In a violet flash of magic, Crossus appeared many miles away in a forest in the southern portion of the Arothi Highlands. Due to the spatial distortions being made by the Dark Portal, this was as close as he could reliably teleport with such little preparation. It would be enough, now that he was far from civilization. For the first time in a long time, the Archmage known as Crossus shed his mortal guise, and Coriolstras took on his true form. With two beats of his heavy wings that scattered the surrounding leaves into the air, the Red Dragon lifted himself into the air and began flying to his queen's location as quickly as he could. I swear, if she is harmed, then I will not rest until I have killed every single person responsible.